Recorded live from the secret underground lair of Crimson Cowl Comics and Collectible, this is the Crimson Cowl Comic Club Podcast. The following issues may contain spoilers. Can someone tell me, please, why this dog is barking at me? I'm Anthony. I'm Kirby. I'm Katie. And I'm Jim. Welcome to issue number 283 of the Crimson Cowl Comic Club podcast. Every time we record, we talk about comic books. On this week's episode, we're going to do a club discussion on the penultimate issue of our miniseries, Marvel Unleashed, issue number three. Then we're going to jump to the weekly reviews. That's where we go back and forth, and we talk about the books that we've been reading, whether they're new, whether they're old. We're going to talk about them there. That is going to be the setup for this show. Let's jump into Marvel Unleashed, issue number three. A stray dog named D-Dog Captain America's faithful Falcon, Red Wing, and Captain Marvel's uh, Flurkin, or as the autocorrect changed it to, Clerked, um, but uh, Captain Marvel's Flurkin, Chewie, have teamed up to find another dog's missing person who seems to work for the villainous organization called AIM. But their search for Myron Darkwater led them to an incapacitated inca- uh, lockjaw kidnapped by Myron and Craven the Hunter as part of a plan to return the demotic Prince Blackheart to the mortal realm. To fight Blackheart, the team called in Throg, Frog of Thunder, with the help of Doctor Strange's ghost bats. Uh, ghost dog bats. Uh, but Blackheart proved too powerful, and now they're trapped in the Tenth Circle with his army of demons. This comic is done by Kyle Starks, Juan Gideon, Yen Nitro, and VCs Joe Caramagna. So here we are in one of the featured variant covers. We have our uh, uh, our Flurkin, uh, Chewy right there in the screen and an awesome uh, variant cover. Uh, this story here, um, they're stuck in that uh, dimension. We're dealing with um, you know losses of Mjolnir and some loss of abilities and trying to figure out uh we actually get a little bit of dialogue with our uh our aim specialist and kind of hearing his side of the story so there's a nice uh good reveal there of uh why he's on this mission working for aim um we're uh at blackheart's fortress as he's trying to track these people down they get a signal that uh there's some activity uh going on we got some battles uh, a lot of fun stuff happening in this issue, setting up this penultimate issue leading into our finale, which will be uh, sometime next month. Uh, it's out now, I believe, but uh, or coming out soon. But uh, yep, this is issue number three, so we're going to dive into our thoughts. Uh, let's kick it off with Kirby first. Thoughts on Marvel Unleashed, issue number three. Still going strong. This is one of my favorite stories so far this picture right here they should put on a t-shirt i love that on the inside first page Uh, but yeah it was nice seeing d-dog do something and not even know that he accomplished it and stuff and find out that there are characters like batman that have no powers you can still do stuff and i like how our ghost dog was able to take over mindless soulless beans and stuff like that and then my other favorite part was the little back and forth banter between uh the bird and chewy going on and on (laughs) what can you do you're just a cat (laughs) and he's never around to see any of it but yeah this this was my favorite issue so far i didn't realize it was penultimate i was thinking it was going five issues so that's a bummer but yeah, <laughs> yeah, we had the big reveal of uh, Chewy uh, letting loose here with all the tentacles and wrapping up all the uh, the bad guys that are attacking. Always, uh, it's an anticipated scene that you just know is eventually going to happen. So it felt good to see that uh, unfold. Cool, cool, cool. Let's jump over to Katie. Thoughts on issue number three? 
Yeah, I really enjoyed this one. I think I like this the best out of the series, and they've all been pretty entertaining so far. Um, I like D Dog a lot. I do hope that D Dog finds a new human to be friends with because she's a sweetheart, and um, I think she deserves a family. But she's also, um, you know, found a little family of friends in this book, so that's really touching too. Um, yeah, the thing with chewy going full flurkin that was really cool i am not a captain marvel regular so uh that was exciting to get to see that and get some perspective on this character i like how in typical cat fashion they can go from being naughty little brats fighting bad guys to just sitting there looking all cute and innocent and, oh who me and licking their paw and stuff so that was really fun um the thing with the rainbow bridge was really touching yeah <laughs> You know, all in a day's work. Plus, hey, that's my bad guys first. Yeah. I thought the thing with the... Yeah, that was really sweet. And the discussion of pet afterlife, like, Frog feels like he's going to go to Valhalla. That was very interesting and a little more philosophical than I think I've ever pondered. But that's a good question. Do pets go to the same afterlife as their owners? It, uh, who can say, but... That's something I've never thought about before, so that's cool. Um, I I really liked the character design of Blackheart. That uh, that character looks super cool to me, and I guess if I think about it, it does look a little bit like the Predator, but still an awesome character design. That was exciting. Um, it's been a while since I've read a Marvel superhero book, so this was you know just nice in that regards, where it's you know typical Marvel shenanigans. A demon is trying to come back in with their army of of baddies and take over the world and it felt very satisfying in that regard that they were able to stop that um i'm not sure how i felt about uh juniper's owner the the scientist working for aim i, I felt like their motivation was a little bit flimsy I, sometimes i just want bad guys who are bad guys <laughs> this one i did i'm not sure i totally bought but you know, I can also see it. I mean, I, I'm i currently working for a subcontractor that our biggest client is ExxonMobil. You know, not a great company, has done some pretty evil things, but I don't think I'm an evil person. I was just trying to get a job to provide for myself. So on the one hand, I can see it. On the other hand, I'm like, we could have made him a little bit more bad, but uh, still really cool execution. I like this book a lot. Um, I'm actually pleased with the story development. I figured this whole series would just be kind of like, you know, something fun and goofy, but they've actually managed to tell, I think, a pretty meaningful story with different beats in it, and I appreciated it. But uh, I I enjoyed it. What does everyone else think? Uh, we'll jump. Well, hey, we have Chewy, uh, Chewy the Flurkin hey! behind our, this is one reason, one of the main reasons. Oh my goodness. If you're listening to the audio version only, that you have to subscribe to Crimson Cowl Comic Club on YouTube because we do have a flurkin right here live on the screen. So Kitty. we'll have to watch out to see if any tentacles uh, uh, are released. Um, Just don't make him angry. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, let's jump over to uh, Jim. Thoughts on issue number three? I really enjoyed this issue. Um, first of all, you got bats who got to see some action by taking over the thing, whatever it was, uh, the demon thing. Um, so that was really cool because bats is my favorite of these pet characters, mm -hmm. even though they don't think they're pets or that they have owners, according to bats, <laughs> which <laughs> takes us back to the conversation they had with Myron. Um, and he's like, Oh my God, I forgot about my pet dog. And it's like, oh, ah, you're <laughs> a bad pet owner. Okay, yes, yes, you are. But first of all, you think that AIM is not a good organization for doing things, so you're going to go and look for extra help from Victor Von Doom? Um, <laughs> what, what kind of thought process is going on here, Myron? <laughs> That's a good point, actually. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't okay, care well, I'm not sure the status of Dr. Doom right now in the universe because he's had a couple, you know, redemption arcs and things like that, but mostly bad, though. Yeah. But um, 
Yeah, you know, science isn't working. Let's try magic too. So yeah, that's always been a good combination. But yeah, um, I've enjoyed this story a lot. Um, I don't know much about the Blackheart character, if this is something new or whatever, but having this character who's from the 10th level of hell is pretty awesome. And uh, at least a very challenging uh, foe for our animal heroes. And I'm looking forward to see Lockjaw in action now too, so. Oh, Since awesome. that is not a character that I am very familiar with. And, uh, you know, how we, you know, like 13th floors are uh, typically bad luck here on Earth 616. But I'm wondering what, like, the th uh, 13th uh, level of hell would be like if that's a lucky, lucky uh, circle of hell for them. You know, we're only experiencing the 10th level right now, but you would think the 13th, you well, know. Well, traditionally, there are only the nine levels of hell. Okay. And that for there to be a tenth one means that there is something that has been added to the Marvel Universe so already. Well, then uh, then we just keep climbing, and eventually we'll get to lucky number 13. Hell has a sub-basement. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, I would agree that about Lockjaw too, waiting to see him in action because that's the, you know, he definitely needed, you know, you know, a sacrifice in the beginning of the story of having one character down, you know, someone that they're trying to uh, rescue and everything. But I'm hoping that uh, Lockjaw definitely gets some uh, some good moments in the last uh, issue. We do have a tease. Um, they talk about it's the final stand against Blackheart as Throg, Red Wing, Chewie, Lockjaw, Bats, and D-Dog put everything that they've got into stopping the son of Mephisto from unleashing his army on the world. But one of them won't make it out alive. Do we want to make some predictions? You know, we don't, you know, normally call this out, but I figure we have our, our characters here. Um, we want to go around the horn and uh, let's start with Kirby. Do you have any predictions? If, we were to lose, unfortunately, lose one of our uh, animals here. Do you have any predictions? Well, one thing I have to mention is I love how when Captain America and Captain Marvel come flying in to save the day, they get zapped right out. It's like, nah, you're not needed. <laughs> so, but my prediction is it's going to be D-Dog, and then something's going to happen that's going to give D-Dog some type of power or something because of the whole ordeal. There we go. There we go. Um, let's jump over to uh, Katie. Do you have a prediction on what animal could possibly fall? Uh, probably D Dog because they're the only one that is, you know, character wise that is new that doesn't have uh, an established canon or history. And I think Kirby makes a good point. That might be a way for uh, D Dog to get a new owner or get some powers. And since they've been talking a lot about the Rainbow Bridge, I, I feel like that's done on purpose. So we're going to see that come into play. But yeah, I love it. I love her, but probably D-Dog. And Jim, any predictions? Um, I also am going to go with uh, D-Dog. And I think she is going to go across the Rainbow Bridge. But I think the Rainbow Bridge she's going to go across is, is the Bifrost. Oh, shit. Sure. And she is going to end up in As Asgard and, be and get her powers there. And if they go to Valhalla or whatever and end up finding Majolner and bringing it back. Oh, that's a good idea. Interesting, interesting. Um, you know, not to say D-Dog, I'm actually going with Throg to kind of lead up to maybe a big summer event where Throg comes back to life and it's a big marvel wide universe event of you know throg returns mm -hmm. but if this throg would die then we get some young tadpole that comes up and has the power and is able to lift the frog olnor however they call it you know the frog me um so yeah i i think i think throg's gonna take a tragic death only to bring up a new tadpole and then to sell a huge mega crossover event with 60 variant covers you know, 300 tie-ins. You have to read every issue of every Marvel comic to get that little chapter of Throg's return. That's what I'm throwing out there. I could see it, yeah. 
So, yeah. Um, or now that you brought that up, just imagine like uh, Jane Foster took over for um, the son of Odin. Could D Dog be taking over for Throg and be the new Throg? <laughs> oh, sure. Dog of Thor Dog like instead dogs. of Thor Frog. <laughs> and that could lead to a story because uh, there's Thori, which is uh, Loki or uh, Thor's dog. And uh, I said Loki because I just read a story with Thor and Loki and. and actually it happened in something i'm talking about next um but yeah uh maybe thori and uh would think that thori deserves the hammer instead of d-dog so yeah that could be a story or black hearts eating throg legs at the end and gain some special <laughs> power. that would be funny well We'll have to uh, read one more issue and we'll come back and see which of our predictions came true. So, yeah, any other? We'll have to, we'll have to send this link to of this podcast to the Marvel publishers so that they can line up their writing teams for the summer blockbuster. There we go. I'm here for it. Um, any lingering thoughts yet for this issue before we move on? They are starting to get a little too Lords of the Ring. <laughs> so, <laughs> epic quest to defeat the one true evil and save the day. <laughs> That's actually a really good idea. You're right. <laughs> and we get that one scene with the big castle in the background. You get all the demons down That's, below. You're right. Just... That's that's really true. There's one bark to rule them all. Alrighty. Uh, that is going to do it then. for. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm going to assume that's it for issue number three of Marvel Unleashed. We have future club discussions because before we get to that, we'll have our one shot for It's Jeff, the Jeff Purse, which is available now, as well as My Little Pony, Black, White, Blue, number one, which is available now. Once Upon a Time at the End of the World, number 11. I believe Howard the Duck number one one shot is coming out shortly. I think it's billed for November yet. Twas the Might Before Christmas. And of course, Marvel Unleashed number four. So that is a lineup for our um, club discussions. On our next episode, we're going to dive into the uh, December catalogs for Marvel and DC. And that's where we could possibly pick some future club discussions for 2024. All right. That is going to do it then for this segment. Let's move over to the weekly reviews. Welcome to the weekly reviews. I'm going to kick it off with Marvel Super Stories, Volume 1. Welcome to the Marvel Universe and the world outside your window. All of your favorite Marvel superheroes are here in an all-new six-page stories uh, written and illustrated by some of the biggest names in comics for young readers. There's a lot of people that worked on this, so I'm just going to go ahead and read the list of names here, we have Jerry Craft, Mike Corrado, C.G. Espinanza, John Gallagher, Gail Galligan, Chris Russo, Nathan Hale, Michael Lee Harris, Ben Herkey, uh, Priya Hook, John Jennings, George O'Connor, Lincoln Pierce, Maria Scrivian, and Jesse Zarbaski, I apologize to all of those people, um, but I'm going to compliment you here with awesome, awesome work. So I remember seeing this in the previews. Um, I think it was buried in the main, uh, the giant catalog. It might have been reprinted in the Marvel one, but it's because this one comes from um, a different publisher that is in uh, uh, from Amulet, Amulet Publishing in association with Marvel for this new graphic novel and uh they labeled it volume one there is promise of a volume two that will be coming soon uh but what this does is take a bunch of characters from the marvel universe and puts them into um six page stories each and uh they're all interpreted by a different cartoonist and so we have uh actually what i'll go through the lineup here to kind of give a little synopsis of everything um, and a little examples, but we have a Spider-Man story in which Peter Parker and Aunt May are going to the Grand Canyon, and uh, it's a fun little adventure where trouble ensues, and Peter Parker has to uh, suit up as 
as Aunt May is uh, enjoying some of the, the sights. Uh, we've got a Black Panther story in which um, T'Challa and Shiri are talking about uh, opening up this international library and they are actually opposed by a bunch of people who are trying to censor books. So this one is very topical and uh, what we've seen with like book bannings and things like that. This is uh, basically Black Panther uh, fighting for the rights uh, to, of this library to exist, which not only contains, you know, books from the U.S. and Wakanda books and other African countries, but as well as books across the universe. So it is literally an international and inner multi-galaxy uh, library that they're out to save. Um, Kirby will perk up when I mentioned that there is a Squirrel Girl story in here. Um, this one is uh, really fun because Squirrel Girl is uh, trying to save some other squirrels who are being taunted um, by somebody uh, that uh, may be trying to bark up the tree. I'll just leave it at that. Um, but yeah, it's a cute little story. Um, we see uh, Tippy Toe in there and Squirrel Girl. And uh, yeah, this one was a lot of fun, real cute. And uh I'll tease that there's a, you know, it doesn't spoil any story or anything, but there is a, I'll, I'll save some of the reveal here though, because this is just a funny sight. So there was a moment where uh, Doreen Green, Squirrel Girl, and Tippy Toe are um, entering an event. And uh, Tippy Toe seems to gain some height in this top panel here uh, with a giant uh, trench coat. And all I'm going to say is that anytime you see a small figure character of sort, in a giant trench coat that maybe there's something hidden underneath to make this character taller. So I'll just leave it at that. It's a fun little tease. Um, both Kate Bishop and Clint Barton uh, both have a story in here together. And uh, this one is a story that are basically going around and uh, trying to uh, save animals around the city. So this one, uh, yeah, both of them are out there and, uh, trying to save these kidnapped pets, basically. Um, there is a Thor story in here, uh, just showing off some of the art. Each each of these stories has uh, different um, art interpretations, uh, both written and uh, drawn by these cartoonists. We have a Miles Morales uh, Spider-Man story, uh, talking about the importance of uh, and the love of the sneakers that Miles wears. Uh, we have a Namor story, where normally I wouldn't really care too much about Namor. I'll show off this uh, awesome cartoony drawing of Namor for this uh, story. Normally, <clears throat> hold on. Uh, normally, weird that I have to get some water when I'm about to talk about Namor's story. So just one <laughs> second here. Uh, man, I might be Atlantean. I didn't know it. So I needed water. I, I've been out of water too long. Um but yeah, this this I, I love the way the story was drawn. And so it took like one of the characters I don't really care about in Marvel Comics and uh, really enjoyed this story a lot more than some of the other ones. So mostly uh, it was just real adorable and cute showing you some uh, other art examples from that one there. Um, we have Sam Wilson, Captain America story in here. Uh, Red Wing also involved. We have an Iron Man story with Tony Stark. There's a lot of them in here, so I, I'll cut to this one here because it'll probably get some smiles. Uh, we have a Shang-Chi story, um, which, you know, Shang-Chi could have some very big uh, extravagant adventures. So you kind of think like, all right, where's this one going to uh, find our hero this time? Well, um, it takes place inside of a cat cafe. So, um, so yeah, like I said, that one might be a little more topical with uh, some of the stuff that we talk about and some of the guest stars on this very YouTube edition of the show. Um, but yeah, so that was a very fun surprise to see Shang-Chi in there. Uh, Chris Russo did a Hulk story that I thought was really strong as well. No puns intended, um, but is a, a pretty classic Bruce Banner type story where he's has an invention and you've got the leader who is uh, trying to basically befriend the Hulk in order to get closer to this invention. Uh, but I love the way this is drawn, real cute, real funny. Um, yeah, so the Hulk story was really good there. 
uh, Wiccan has a story, uh, the son of the Scarlet Witch. And uh, the Wiccan basically is trying to use some magic, but this time in the kitchen, trying to bake up a um, a nice tasty treat for uh, his husband, Teddy. And uh, so that was a fun, once again, like some of these here, when you're thinking about you're getting your big action set pieces. And I like some of these were also, nope, you're at a cat cafe, you're in the kitchen and, you know, squirrel girls just dealing with the tree, you know, squirrels in a tree. So there's a lot of fun stories in here. A nice little balance of, of um, high level threat and low level threats. Um, and then one I was looking forward to is Kamala Khan has a story in here. And uh, it's all about her dealing with the fact that she is a B-list superhero. I really love the art style on this one. It uh, really shakes it up from some of the other ones that are presented here in this book. But it is Kamala going around Jersey City and trying to deal with the fact that, you know, the, thinking that she's only a B-level superhero, but there are elements and things in this uh, city in this story that reminder just how important she is uh ghost spider has a story so spider gwen is in here as well and uh, her story is pretty great just dealing with uh fighting some threats as she is basically being late for band practice with the mary janes if you're unfamiliar with gwen uh, spider gwen stories um so that was another little fun one and then it wrapped up one more with uh, matt murdoch daredevil and uh, dealing with uh, the whole concept of fear. This one was actually probably one of the more, like, uh, more commonly known type of Marvel superhero stories that you would get in the normal books. Some of these other stories are definitely pretty light and fluffy and, you know, fun for kids of all ages. This was probably the more grown-up one uh, as far as just dealing with a lot of action and just dealing with a lot of fear and uh, what happens uh, when Matt Murdock is confronting these fears uh, but yeah this was a lot of fun every story was a pretty good hit in here uh, pretty enjoyable read i was excited to see that there is a volume two that will be coming out soon so i will be looking forward to that and uh yeah this was excellent this is great for readers of all ages uh whether they know anything about the marvel universe or just the movies and this is awesome awesome stuff so this is marvel super stories volume one and uh yeah that's all I got to say about that. Jump over to Kirby. At Crypt of Shadows from Marvel Comics. This is a nice group of stories, short stories, complete stories. And then it's got Doctor Strange's brother, evil brother i guess i like him better than dr strange but he's kind of a vampire character that got locked in behind a mirror for now and he's doing the crypt keeper style part of the whole storyline and telling us about getting us started on the stories and finished with with each story as we go along and he works out perfect for it and his parts are done by Al Ewing, Paul Davidson, Green Burrito, DC's Travis Lanham, and Jordan D. White. And the first story is called Brick by Brick by Steve Orlando, Paul Azetta, and Travis Lanham. This story kind of had this haunted house that the way they did it in the beginning, they you see the house getting blown up, and it's like back in 1985 when this is happening, and then we jump to current day, but you still see all this destruction and fire, so it was kind of a little bit confusing, but Scarlet Witch is the main character in this one, and we find out that the house is haunted. The bricks and stuff have spirits connected to them. And sh this is all happening in her town. And so she comes in to save everybody and deal with it. And you just get to see what happens when you read the story. And then we jump over to The Living and the Dead by Kevin Scott and Devmelia Premenik, Naraj Menon, and Travis Lanham again. And in this story, we have like a 
voodoo priestess that's taking powers from a mummy. She rips out, rips the heart out of a carcass of this or whatever out of the mummy in the tomb, which amazes me that the heart's still still there, all all in complete peace, and it's just pumping away. But uh, she's doing this, and at the same time, Deadpool appears to deal with the situation and I can't really give much out because there's a nice little twist with the whole thing between the uh, shaman and the mummy and then Deadpool coming in and the whole twist and turns that happen along the way but yeah that was a really fun story uh, then we get without fear like Anthony this was a daredevil story and it's based on fear because just so happens Daredevil's getting his butt whooped and man thing just happens to appear out of the dark. He's like, who the heck, who's waking me up from my slumber? And he comes out and kind of interferes with everything that's going on. And if you know man thing, if you show fear, you'll burst into flames. If you touch them and daredevil being the man without fear he doesn't have to worry and he's worked with man thing in the past so there's a nice little storyline there with them and that was probably one of my favorite stories in this and then we get a soul worth hunting by sarah galley eater messias jonas trindade and michael wiggum and again travis lanham and in this story, we kind of get a werewolf character popping up, and we end up having someone hunting the werewolf or hunting another character, and the werewolf comes across it and sees him chained up and hanging from a tree and busts them loose. And we find out that it's the Hulk. And we find out who's hunting the Hulk. It's... uh, (laughs) Come on. Uh, I can't stand him, but he's got a movie coming out. Uh, Why am I going blank? John Cena. No, come on. The Hunter. Oh, Craven the Hunter. The Rock? Craven the Hunter. For some reason, his name just totally disappeared from my head. And I can't stand him, but Every time I read a story about him, I'm liking him more and more. And in this story, I really like what they did with him again. So he's pulling me in. I'm happy about the movie. I'm going to definitely go check it out. But uh, especially since they teased Rhino. But yeah, you catch him hunting the Hulk because he's wanting to use the Hulk for something else in his future. And our werewolf character ends up intervening and the battle goes on and then we get a little nice little fun twisted ending with dr strange's brother in the end and stuff and this one is a one shot the one last year was three issues i kind of wish they would have done the same thing with this one but yeah this is definitely worth picking out all great stories and all complete so great cool 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 all right, let's jump over to Katie. What you got for us? All right, this week I have another volume from Comey Can't Communicate. I have volume 13 of Comey Can't Communicate by Tomohito Oda. Um, in this volume, so uh, there's a little girl who is, I think, a relative of theirs or a family friend of theirs uh, named Ray staying with the Comeys and Comey's mom who's hilarious I love her absolute queen is trying to get uh Shoko Comey uh the Comey of you know of the title to play with this little girl named Ray and both Comey and Ray have a communication disorder but it kind of manifests in different ways whereas Comey really does want to make friends and be able to communicate and socialize and not have so much anxiety in situations. Whereas Ray, um, 
has moved around so much since she's been a little kid that her strategy is just shut everybody out like don't engage don't try and be friends with them like don't try and play with them because you're just going to end up having to move away and you'll never see them again and it will be so hard and really hurt your heart and you know you don't want to keep going through that pain but the girls are forced to kind of look after each other and play together um one day Comey's mom goes out for a while and gives them this whole big list of tasks to do basically to force them to kind of socialize um as a reminder Comey's mom is like the only one in the family that is more extroverted that enjoys talking to people and has a very active social life um so uh, the girls decide that they need to go shopping to get some food for supper and this is where I really 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 was captured by this book um it it shows me probably one of the more relatable depictions of an anxiety attack or a panic attack in public and i really appreciated that um because hollywood honestly does not always get it right um but this was basically the girls are at the market and ray just gets overwhelmed by everything going on around her and the fact that comey is being nice to her and giving her attention and it just pushes her too far and she she gets upset and gets overwhelmed and ends up running away from Comey and you know she's like don't touch me leave me alone and she gets super upset and uh, ends up falling and skinning her knee and she um, had like a little Pikachu toy that ends up falling and breaking and she just can't handle it and Comey is really concerned right because like she can see that this person's upset and she's worried that she did something to like really hurt her um and then Comey ends up mobilizing her friends that we've seen throughout these volumes to try and find Ray and and bring her back because this little eight-year-old girl should not should not be by themselves um uh Najimi of course comes in and saves the day I love that character so much and the girl is all like, leave me alone. I don't want to go with you. She, she's met Najimi before. It's not like some stranger just came and picked her up. Uh, and Najimi's just like, of course you do. And like puts her on in a big piggyback and takes her back to Comey's house. Um, and then the girls had, I felt like a really, for them, meaningful conversation about what happened. And um Comey actually does quite a bit of communicating so for her that's really important growth um I I really liked that it felt very it felt similar to how I experience anxiety attacks um in just that like you're fine and then all of a sudden you're overwhelmed and like you can't stop it and it's just too much for you and you end up panicking and like making it worse on yourself so I really appreciated that and it was also a really good character arc for both of the girls because they both had to be vulnerable and um, open themselves up to other people in a way that was like really difficult for them, but it had to be done. And it showed them a lot of growth because now Ray is like, all right, you know, I actually do want to make friends and get close to people. And Comey had to use her voice to, in a, you know, a very scary situation, solve a problem and communicate how she was feeling and how she was, you know, concerned for Ray's feelings so I thought that was really powerful. Uh, and, you know, they clean up her skin knees and she gets her Pikachu back. So that's all lovely. And then the girls are friends. So uh, in later episodes, you know, they're giving Comey's brother Shoshuke a hard time and teasing him. And they go to the park and are trying to find four leaf clovers together. Uh, so really cute. And some kids from Comey's class come and they all play together and I really liked that. It was just really powerful character development. And then because, you know, it's a bit bittersweet, Ray's mom comes back and is like, hey, you ready to go? You know, I, I've got a new job in America. I've got a place there. And Ray has very mixed feelings about this because she she does want to stay with Comey and she doesn't want to move again. But her and Comey decided that they're going to have a little competition to see who can get 100 friends first. Um, that's been Comey's goal from the beginning. So now her and Ray are going to have a competition and Comey has assured her that Ray, uh, 
will be able to make friends wherever she goes. And eventually you'll know so many people that you'll, you'll always be bumping into somebody. And even though it hurts and it sucks and it's awful to leave your friends, like you still have the good times together. And so we see a little epilogue of Ray in America uh, working to make new friends at her school that I just thought was really touching. Um, there's a couple other sub stories in this book, but that was the one that I thought impacted me the most. And I really liked it. Um, just very important character growth for all of them. Very relatable. And I enjoyed this. Um, I, I mostly started reading this series because my brother's really into it. And, I, you know, I wanted to, you know, be nice to him. And I'm really, really liking it. It it had a lot of heart. Anyway, that's my review of Comey Can't Communicate, Volume 13. Uh, if you also want to read this series, they're up to, they're somewhere in the 20s at this point. And I highly recommend that you check out Comey Can't Communicate by Tomohito Oda. Excellent. All right. Uh, next one on my list here is The Holy Roller, number one. To care for his ailing father, pro bowler Levi Cohen is forced to quit his dream job and return to his hometown, which he soon discovers has been overrun by neo-Nazis. With only his bowling ball collection to defend himself, Levi becomes the Holy Roller, a trick bowling ball wielding Jewish superhero battling to liberate his home and bowl a perfect game against crime. This is Kingpin meets Inglorious Bastards meets Batman. You know, that old chestnut. With equal parts action and humor in this special introductory issue with 42 full pages of story, two issues for the price of one, three writers for the price of one, same great low price. This is by Rick Remender, Andy Samberg, Joe Troman, Roland Bosky, and Moreno Denisio, and Russ Wooten. Uh, apologies to those names I just said there, but I will compliment you with an awesome issue. That's, uh, I'm going to go forward with that. Anytime I know I butchered some names, I'm just going to say I'm sorry, but hey, time for the compliments. This was a lot of fun. Now, um, I'm definitely intrigued by the main cover here and seeing, seeing this, you know, kind of a bloody bowling ball type of thing. Not really sure what's going on. You got some kind of, you know, robot tech type suit, which is something you don't get into in this first issue. So uh, it was really kind of, um, teased by what uh, this could be and while rick remender and everybody else involved has a lot of great credits to their name um what caught my attention and it's probably very purposeful is andy sandberg snl's andy sandberg brooklyn 99 um hot rod um this is him co-writing a comic book um i know some other snl alum have uh, done the same um i know bill Hader has done a spider-man comic in the past i think it was bill Hader and Seth Myers, so I don't think Andy has done any yet. This might be his first. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was one of the main draws. And uh, this story uh, kind of opens up, it kind of sets you in the time frame of an 80s Stranger Things type of, you know, uh, bowling alley arcade attached to it type of scenario. You get that vibe. Um, it definitely takes place in the past for this opening story. Yeah, it takes place in the mid 80s, um, but it is dealing with um, Levi's dad, who is this holy roller, as they call him. He's this uh, he's this uh, big time bowler that is uh, winning prizes and such. Although when you kind of zoom out a little bit or maybe zoom in, depending on what the metaphor is, uh, you realize that it's just this small kind of rundown little bowling alley. It's not any kind of championship national thing or anything like that. But on the level of um, of their little community, you know, he's kind of treated as a big thing. They're excited. You know, he gets some coupons and wins like five dollars for the arcade. And like so they, they kind of really like amp up that opening to be like, all right, big time pro bowler. And then it's just like, all right, he's just in a, you know, his local bowling alley. Uh, but the main story is dealing with uh, Levi, who is uh, witnessing his dad's quote unquote fame this whole time. And um, Levi himself is dealing with bullies within the arcade uh, as he just kind of just doesn't want anything to do with the bowling. He's kind of embarrassed about all of that. And he has his own troubles and such. But then there's a bully within the arcade that just kind of just shows that he cannot win at any 
uh, moment in his life here. We take a hard cut to the present day. So we jump from the mid 80s till the present day and we uh, catch up with Levi as now he's uh, hanging out on a boat. We see he's actually part of uh, Greenpeace. He's working with Greenpeace and uh, you see him just kind of hanging around, just, you know, mostly kind of relaxing on this boat. You're kind of just trying to figure out what has happened in these last, uh, you know, for almost 40 years, um, what's been happening to this guy. Uh, but you realize that uh, he he hasn't seen his father since uh, being a kid. So all this time he hasn't seen his dad. And we find out, as the uh, synopsis mentioned, um, his dad is uh, failing in health. And this is what's going to get Levi to go back to his hometown and uh, his uh, small Jewish community that he lives within. And that's when he starts seeing all of the stuff with the neo-Nazi um, kind of infiltrating their community and um, re trying to reconnect with his dad all this time and, and not really having any sort of um, connection with him, not really relating to him and both kind of just being on separate journeys and stuff. But um, that's all I'm going to really say. A lot of what I talked about is right there in the synopsis. Um but we do see uh, Levi, who uh, does happen to run back into the old uh, bowling alley in present day, kind of shocked that it's still standing. Uh, but all of these things are, you know, it, the whole little city that he came from is just in shambles and it's just kind of run down and really just a lot of things that happened since then. But uh, and he's going to have to face some of his um, past fears some of his past uh complications his past bullies and villains and such and that kind of leads to an action scene which kind of shows you why maybe there's a bowling ball that is also has blood on it so i'm just going to leave it at that i think it does a good example of saying kingpin meets inglorious bastards meets batman um very accurate interpretation of this um this was a lot of fun uh, it, it is a ver very mature comic. It, it definitely has kind of a, a funny premise in the sense that, all right, he's going to start hitting people with bowling balls. Like, all right, I see a bowling ball superhero or something like it definitely has a goofy premise, but it is rooted in a lot of serious stuff. Well, like I said, with the Jewish community and seeing the takeover and what's happening with his dad and the relationships and everything. So I think there's going to be a lot of heart, a lot of surprising heart, within the story. I'm not sure how long this is going, um, but I'm definitely on board uh, for $3.99. You got a 42 page uh, issue. And as they mentioned, you get three entire writers on this book. So man, where else can you get three writers on one comic? This is, you're getting more bang for your buck here, but no, this was a lot of fun. I highly recommend the Holy Roller issue. Number one. Kirby. I got Giant Robot Hellboy, number one of three, by Mike Magnola, Duncan Figueredo, and Dave Stewart. This is enjoyable, but it was a little strange how they set it up, because we have Hellboy just walking the streets, hanging out, being a, just not doing anything fancy, just going around, and all of a sudden a van pulls up. And they kidnap him. Well, they obviously need Hellboy to help him do something. So let's just kidnap him. Let's drug him up, stick him in a machine. <laughs> they don't talk to the guy at all. He's just knocked out. This whole time we get the characters that are running this whole fiasco. setting them up inside like a virtual reality style machine and here you got him in his chair all locked up with the brain box on and stuff and then we see this giant box get dropped off on an island well the giant box just so happens to contain our giant robot hellboy inside and we find out that Hellboy is controlling the giant robot Hellboy. 
from the chair that he's locked up in. And you see this robot, like, what the hell's going on? I'm looking, he's looking at his hands like, oh shit, something's going on that I don't know about. And then he's walking around and he's just having the hardest time walking. He's stumbling. He's all confused. It's like, if you would have told Hellboy that, hey, we need you to do this. We got a giant robot of you. You're going to go into this machine and you're going to control a robot. I don't think Hellboy would have argued. And he's going into a battle. He doesn't physically have to battle it himself. He gets to control the robot to do the battle. So I don't know why he'd complain unless they're evil. But why would you make a Hellboy-related item if you're evil in the first place? But uh, I do like we have this female character that's on the island with them, and she's trying to find search down for some type of tech or something that they're looking for, open up a certain vault. And while she's doing that, we got these giant spiders that appear and other critters appear. And she deals with that while the giant robot Hellboy basically takes on Godzilla. (laughs) So we basically got a big kaiju battle going on here. But yeah, I, I didn't understand I mean, hopefully in the next issue, they'll explain who these two characters are that are controlling everything and let us know why they brought Hellboy in and didn't talk to him about it or anything. So he was always, he never had a problem helping anybody out as long as you're not complete evil from all the stories we've read. And I think this would have been a lot more fun if he knew what was going on and he just, he got a little training and could understand how to control the robot instead of just tying him up and (laughs) just all of a sudden he wakes up from his drug induced coma and he's in a seat and he's already locked into the robot. I mean, that's obviously the robot's not going to perform well (laughs) when he doesn't know what he's doing, how he operates it or anything like that, or what his abilities are with it. But, but yeah, we basically got a Kaiju battle going on with this and it's going to lead into some more stuff. But I'm really hoping that the second issue gives us a little bit more of a description of what the heck is going on. What? Why are we here? Why are we on this island? Who are these people? I mean, it's like the only baddie that we really see on the island are these giant insects and giant lizards and stuff like that. So I don't, don't see any other humans yet. So, yeah, they got, got a lot of explaining to do, Lucy. But with only two more issues, I don't know how much more explaining we're going to get. That's the only thing that worries me. This might be too quick of a setup and an and a ending right off the bat. But we will see. I like it. I'd love to see this go a little further and see where it goes. But I just wish they would have took that type of uh, effort into it where he knew what was going on and just instead of just throwing him into it. But otherwise... One of the more fun Hellboy stories t- that they've put out there. So, Cool, cool, cool. And you actually have the final pick as well. So if you are ready for it. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I picked up Night of the Living Dead Kin. I got issue one and two in the mail last week. I ordered these, I feel like a year ago. <laughs> and it was supposed to be like a five issue run, I think. I don't even know if the third one's even out of print, out for print yet, or if it's coming, or if that if it's only three issues. Because I know I got at least one more coming, but I thought felt like I ordered more than that. But I was really excited when this came out because it takes us prior to the Night of the Living Dead movie, and this is done by S. A. Check and James Kahorik, Giancarlo. Caracuzzo, Rob Jones, and Jeremy Kahn. We basically get, if you if you know Night of the Living Dead at all, there's the hillbilly, the old man, and the girl that are at the house. And that's who we're dealing with here. We got the girl, she's out in the woods, doing some target practice, working her bow and her knife, and she's got her little dummies set up in the woods that she practiced on and this is prior to anything happening 
uh, she's just doing her normal hunting motions, and all of a sudden, we got her uncle, her dad, her whole clan and stuff. Her uncle's chopping wood, and all of a sudden, he just hurt, just has a heart attack, falls over, collapses. So that happens just as she's getting back to camp. And then they do a whole funeral thing, bury them. And the next day, she's out in the woods and just sitting by a little campfire. She get, had a little argument with Pops and said, said I mean, they gave her crap because she's a girl. And she's like, well, I can hunt. And it's like she brought a bunch of squirrels in and stuff for food and he's like oh that's not really going to feed anybody so she decides to grab her weaponry her radio and stuff and go off into the woods and go hopefully get a deer or whatever and she's sitting around a campfire and all of a sudden her uncle appears and he's not talking to her she's trying to find out why he's alive what happened how did you why are you out of your grave he has some broken wood from the coffin on it he's carrying at first and stuff when she sees oh it's actually sitting in his leg and stuff kind of stabbed into him and she gives him a big hug and he's like just starts grabbing at her and just wanting to basically eat her flesh and keeps chasing after her. she keeps fighting back keeps running away and at the same time she's hearing these radio things going on it's like people are getting out of hand they're fighting they're attacking each other they're eventually you start hearing about people eating human flesh and all this stuff and she's still not getting it she's just trying to stay away from him and he keeps stalking her and they end up where she goes off a cliff and they end up both falling off a cliff and (laughs) end up entwined all well basically that I can't find the picture but they basically end up all twisted up yeah there we go twisted up in vines right next to each other and he sits there and keeps wanting to grab her and bite her and she's trying to defend herself and eventually she realizes well I do have a knife in my boot so she tries to get that, and while she's doing that, the, one of the branches snaps on her side, so she get her arm free, and all of a sudden a branch on his side snaps, and you can imagine the back and forth and all that going on, and it basically gets us deeper into the story. Her brother and father are hunting down her, trying to find out what happened she never came back home so they were worried about her but they know that she took a radio and her stuff so they knew she was going off to do something and <clears throat> when they find them they're already down on the ground they both fell from their branches and he's basically going after her again and uh, her dad and brother show up and basically help her out. Eventually, because she just keep after they she gets away from them and hit from him again, knocks him in the head and gets away. And then she goes to cross a river, but I forget why she can't go in the water part. But she goes across the bridge and the bridge breaks and. She falls in that and gets stuck, and then he's coming and gets closer to her, and then he comes out on the bridge, and this bridge must just be all rotted out because the whole thing eventually collapses, and then her brother and dad help battle in the bridge, and that's when her dad gets thrown off the bridge, and her brother gets bitten by her uncle, and then her and her brother go hide, and she tries to help him, and then she tries to go get help, and comes back and he's starting to have problems and then her and him she takes them to try and get him some help and they end up coming across 
a house out in the middle of nowhere, and that will be the house from Night of the Living Dead that they'll be secured in, and she'll be the girl in the basement that's turned zombified and stuff, and then you got the old man upstairs with the shotgun and all that. But, yeah, I was waiting forever for this to come out, and then all of a sudden, two issues appear. <laughs> it's like, so... I'm not sure if we're going to get a third issue or how long Anthony should be good at that. <laughs> so according to the uh, CLZ app, which I often go to for the release dates, they say that both issue three and four will be out November 29th, which at the time of this recording is this coming Wednesday, new comic book day, whether or not that's updated and true, but it looks like three and four are going to drop on the same day. And issue one and two are just like within a, very short window of each other so yeah yeah so they must have had some printing issues and then they finally got them out so that'll be nice get the last two all together so works for me but yeah they're already at the house so there isn't much of a story left i'm assuming just getting them settled settled in and then the, the other guy that shows up at the house who might get a little teaser of his background or something which i'm hoping but yeah i always love that movie so it was nice to get a little prequel to it. Cool. All right. Well, then that is going to do it for the weekly reviews as well as this show. To give us some plugs, crimsoncowl.com for information and original web comics done by David Gloyd and his son, David Gloyd II. So go to crimsoncowl.com for that. Crimson Cowl Comic Club on iTunes. If you could subscribe, rate, and review for the audio version. Let's say you're listening to that audio version and we make a reference to a cat jumping up on the screen. We're showing off a cool cover or a page or a panel. Maybe there's just so many cool things that are happening that you can only hear. Well, go to Crimson Cowl Comic Club on YouTube and subscribe and watch the video version as well. Uh, you can also reach out to us, uh, The Crimson Cowl, all one word on Instagram, Crimson Cowl Comic Club at yahoo.com. Uh, Kirby has a spinoff podcast called Under the Cowl of MS. Anything you'd like to promote for things that just came out or things on the horizon? Uh, we got some new comic book review episodes up. We got one new unpacking. Another one will be coming up today. Well, probably a few days before this gets posted and uh i'll have more i already have a couple more comic book reviews in the bank and then i've got a couple audio podcasts out but nothing too exciting with those yet so but yeah we're getting back well cool so subscribe to under the call of ms wherever you get your podcast as well as youtube um, I have artist accounts on Instagram and Facebook, Anthony Latch, L-A-A-T-S-C-H. So check out the artwork. I just recently revealed these uh, Peanuts and Nintendo collaborations. I've been doing them, calling them Nintendo Nuts. So my Nintendo Nuts series is out there uh, for everybody to see. Um, there's some more Mario related stuff coming uh, that might be out by the time you hear this. Uh, but check out my artist counts on Facebook and Instagram. I also host Cartoonist by Night, uh, four friends hanging out to draw on YouTube. So check out Cartoonist by Night over on YouTube. And some great Crimson Cowl Media news. Uh, Crimson Cowl Media will be at the Mighty Con in Madison, Sunday, December 10th. The time this is released, it's about one week away. Um, but Mighty Con Madison, Sunday, December 10th. Go to MightyConShows.com. For information and tickets, I will be there with my poster prints, with original art. I've got some 4 by 6 art pieces. I've got some smaller sketch cards. I'll be debuting some bookmarks. I forget if I revealed anything on this show. It might have been off air, but this is a little tease. Uh, i got some bookmarks coming out. Um, and uh, and then David Gloyd will be there selling some uh, old merchandise from the old storefront location, as well as original art himself. And his son, David Gloyd II, or is known on this podcast years ago, Other David, or was he Other Other David? I think he was Other Other David. Um, so he will be there as well, making his debut as an artist at a comic book convention. They are the ones who create the web comics that are available on crimsoncull.com. So they'll be there in person and will be joined by a friend named Vince Wilson, who does uh, 3D uh, art and resin uh, painting. 
Um, so yeah, that is going to be awesome. Mightyconshows.com Sunday, December 10th. And then David and I will be sitting down to uh, pave out a schedule for 2024 and basically try to do as many as these as we can around the area. Uh, that is going to do it for this episode. Uh, the next episode, we'll have some future club discussions. We'll dive into the Marvel and DC uh, December 2023 previews. And, uh, and of course, more weekly reviews. That's going to do it for this episode. This whole time, I've been a B-level podcaster. I've been taking out zombies with my mecha flirting. I've been joining the Fellowship of the Pets. I'm wondering what happens to a ghost dog if it dies. Be continued. Thank you, Slimer.